Hello everyone. So I'm going to talk a little bit about End of Licence today and what we're at in Cork and what we've been doing over the past number of years. Um, an overview of what I'll talk about is some of the main End of Licence that we've been working with using Staphylococcus aureus as a primary example but also some of these other um, targets as well. I'll also be mentioning some of the challenges with delivery of End of Licence. So phage therapy as we all know is the elimination of problematic bacteria using whole phages and as we're all well aware from isolating phages, notwithstanding the exquisite work that was in the described in the previous presentation, there is a limited host range problem with many phages. In addition, there's also inherent phage resistance systems, which can also compromise the workings of phages which have been isolated from the environment. So there are problems with it. In addition to that, um, you can have problems where you're trying to apply the phages. There can be some environmental parameters that um, inhibit the activity of phages. As we found in this case, when you try to use a staphylococcal phage against staphylococcus in raw milk, you've got immunoglobulins present, which compromise the interaction between the phages and their hosts. So that brings us to using peptidoglycan hydrolase enzymes which circumvents a lot of these host range difficulties. Endolysins, as you know, are the enzymes which mediate the, the uh, destruction of the peptidoglycan, mediating release of progeny phages, permitting the continuation of the lytic cycle. Another enzyme which does a similar thing to the peptidoglycan is the tail associated hydrolase, which mediates the injection of the phage genome into the into the bacterial host um, and the genes for these can be readily found on any phage genome you see down here the tail tip hydrolase and the endolysin they're readily located these are some classic um classical you know typical endolysins and tail hydrolases you see in the upper one the endolysin has two enzymatic domains a cysteine histidine amidohydrolase peptidase and an amidase and a cell binding domain, which is necessary to localize the endolysin in the peptidoglycan where it's needed to do its job rather than leaking out into the environment. Um, in the tail tip hydrolase, you can see there's two enzymatic domains in one of these here that we've characterized. And also what you can see in this diagram is the particular bonds that these various enzymatic domains act upon in the peptidoglycan. So purification of endolysins, at the moment we're using this particular vector system, PET28A, which has a T7 promoter, and we clone these into E. coli, use either HISTAG or cation exchange chromatography to generally make milligram quantities of endolysins, and this works quite well. We can see the activity of these endolysins by using polyacrylamide gel, gels with impregnated cells. These are called zymograms, and you see the clearing here. And this is a routine experiment which we do with these endolysins. Um, this is just a clip from a video. Basically, we're adding some endolysin to the tube on the left and some buffer to the tube on the right. Uh, I won't go through the video now, but show you the end result. You see complete clearing over a couple of minutes of the completely turbid culture to uh, a, a clear culture where the endolysin is present. It's quite rapid. Um, this is just some properties of CHAP-K. This is done with all of the endolysins which we would generally work with. You, you know, establish the pH range, temperature range, and also its robustness to, you know, its shelf life and freeze thaw uh, stability, etc. And from our observations, we consider that long-term storage is best achieved by lyophilization. Um, in vivo applications, I'm just to, going to quickly describe one experiment we've done here many years ago where we've looked at the phage K endolysin against Staphylococcus aureus. Um, we've colonized um, some animals, 14 animals, with a bioluminescent Staphylococcus aureus, which is lighting up here in the nares of the animal. As, as we all know, nasal carriage is the, one of the primary sources of Staphylococcus aureus bacteremia in hospitals. So with this experiment, we had 14 animals colonized with this bioluminescent Staphylococcus aureus. Seven were left untreated and seven were treated with the endolysin. And after one hour's exposure to the endolysin, the treated group here show no Staphylococci present whatsoever, whereas the control group 
are still showing the presence of the bioluminescent staphylococci. Um, we've also shown that um, it can be used for eliminating staphylococci on surfaces, whether it be skin or bench surfaces as well, uh, typically reducing the carriage by uh, two log cycles. Coming back to host range, um, um, this just gives you an idea of the staphylococcal enzyme and the extent at which it's, it's active. These three here are some members from the national MRSA collection and the height of the graph represents the change in optical density after you add the endolysin to the culture. So these all represent a very high level of activity. These are a few EPS producing um, staphylococci and these here are non staphylococcus aureus there are other species of staphylococci and you can see there's no real major difference in the sensitivity of all of these strains to the endolysin something that you don't generally see with whole phages in addition to working quite well within the genus it also has some activity against genera which are closely related to Staphylococcus aureus on the phylogenetic tree. Um, we've done a lot of work on the structure of this uh, with the help of uh, Mark Van Raj in Spain. This slide here just shows a bio, uh, sorry, um, an, an in silico model of the CHAP endolysin. And one thing which we were lucky to find about this enzyme is that it has a strong positive charge, which is, it's not the norm for a lot of endolysins, but this facilitates the interaction between this particular endolysin and the negatively charged gram-positive cell wall due to the presence of tachoic acids. So this is just a fortuitous property of this particular gram-positive endolysin. Um, I've spoken before about a lot of the um, modifications we've made to the CHAP enzyme to try to enhance its activity. We did a whole range of um, site-directed mutagenesis, which did either knock out activity or compromised activity in some way, we were never fortunate enough to find through site-directed mutagenesis an improved activity. However, we did one modification which did improve activity and I'm just going to go into this in the context of biofilms. Biofilms are a very special target. Um, a lot of the phage work that people do routinely in labs usually involve log phase or late log phase cultures cells which are growing quite actively. In a biofilm, cells are not generally in the exponential phase of growth. We're normally talking about cells which are in the stationary phase. And in this particular state, they exhibit higher tolerance to not only phages, but also antibiotics. And biofilms are responsible for a variety of medical conditions, which I've listed here at the bottom. Um, the difficulty with stationary phase cells is there's, there's a variety of physiological factors within the cell which have changed, and among those is an increased thickness in the peptidoglycan. And in our lab, we found that um, we found that the cultures and the cells in biofilms tend to be a bit more resistant to the um, endolysin than they are in, you know, liquid cultures. So this is a modification that we made. We took the cell binding domain of lysostaphan and fused it to the CHAP-K um, enzymatic domain of phage-K, making this chimeric protein. And this was one thing that did result in improved activity. The only modification we made that improved the level of activity of this endolysin. This graph here briefly shows it. This is CHAP-K here on the left at various concentrations of endolysin. If you look at the five microgram per mil concentration, you're seeing a bit of activity there. Five micrograms per mil using the chimeric protein gives you far better activity and far quicker activity. If you look at old cultures, okay, there were log phase cultures on the previous slide, you also see this enhanced activity. If you look at five micrograms per mil with CHAP-K, you've got no activity whatsoever, no reduction in optical density. With the chimeric protein, you are seeing an improvement in reduction of optical density, and also at 20 micrograms per mil, a more marked reduction in optical density. So the chimeric protein appears to be a lot better. You'll see that I presented these in micrograms per mil. The chimeric protein is almost double the size of CHAP. So there's, there's half the amount of active sites present in this enzyme. So it's actually better than what you're actually seeing on this if it were expressed in micromolar, um, in a micromolar way. It's just these are the only graphs which I had. Um, looking at the biofilm uh, prevention assays, 
you see that um, CAPK is quite slow in reducing the biofilms in both log phase and seven day old cultures, whereas the chimeric protein works a lot faster in eliminating the biofilm. And it's quantified here on this graph. The green represents the seven day old cultures. This is the optical density of the biofilm. So this is, uh, you know, the biofilm is surviving here. And this one, this is zero uh, micrograms of endolysin and you've good survival of the biofilm. And you can see that in adding various concentrations of CHAP enzyme, you're not getting any great reduction in the biofilm density with the seven day old culture you do see some reduction in density with the fresh cultures. With the chimeric protein, you're seeing a far better reduction in optical density of the biofilm using the chimeric protein. So that's definitely an improved situation. Um, and we're advancing that work in the moment in the context of real physiological biofilms with the um, Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. And that work is ongoing at present. All of the biofilm work that I've talked about up to here has been with our own laboratory scale in vitro biofilms. Next, what I want to move on to is delivery systems for endolysins. Um, one of the, the first method that we tried was secretion vectors. This is delivery from bacterial hosts. And the second system that we've tried is using nanoparticles. So I'm going to talk briefly about both of these. Um, this is a, an expression vector which works in Lactococcus lactis. It's, um, it's, it's got a signal peptide from Lactobacillus brevis and it secretes the protein which is cloned into the vector. Um, this is introduced into Lactococcus lactis, a food grade bacterium. And when we've done this, we've seen that um, you do get indeed secretion of the endolysin from the transformant. This is Lactococcus lactis secreting CHAP. And you see on a lawn of Staphylococcus aureus cells here, you can see the clearing mediated by the endolysin by comparison with the control Lactococcus lactis, uh, which just has the plasmid vector without any insert. You're seeing no endolysin. So in principle, the system does work, although the concentration is a little bit low. Using nanoparticle technology, on the other hand, um, we did a collaboration a couple of years ago with um, Toby Jenkins at Bath University, where they used uh, polyisopropyl acrylamide nanoparticles containing CHAP, and they, they fused these to, um, to um, dressings, wound dressings, polypropylene dressings, and they, they, they set up a thermally triggered release of the endolysin using this nanoparticle system. Um, it's described in a publication which came out a few years ago. And essentially what happens is at 32 degrees centigrade, normal skin temperature, um, the nanoparticle is intact. When you move up to 37 degrees centigrade, you get disruption of the nanoparticle and release of its payload of endolysin. So you can here, see here the dressing with the nanoparticles containing CHAP at 32 degrees centigrade, you've um, no release of endolysin and in triplicate here, you've seen all the cells surviving. At 37 degrees centigrade, you're seeing complete remove, complete elimination, of, not complete elimination, but there's a, a four log cycle reduction in cell number after you shift up to 37 degrees centigrade and um, the, the endolysin is released. So that's all described in detail in a paper from Bath University in collaboration with ourselves. Um, I'm going to stay in that context as well, but I just want to briefly um, just uh, diverge to Clostridium difficile and its endolysin that we've also worked with. Uh, C. diff is a frequent cause of antibiotic associated nosocomial diarrhea. Um, it's quite a serious pathogen in, 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 the, in modern hospitals. Uh, C. diff also is very antibiotic resistant and is difficult to treat. So uh, working with Olivia McAuliffe in Moore Park, we isolated a phage for Clostridium difficile, sequenced its genome, um, it doesn't have a very broad host range, as you see here, but on the genome, we, we found the endolysin, which is a nematase, cloned it, looked at its activity using plate counts and found that it was reasonably good. We, we've also worked with some other C. diff endolysins since then, but basically the strategy with these particular endolysins coming back to delivery again is cloning it into this vector, putting it into the, putting it into the lactic acid bacterium vector, PNZ, 
with the idea that we'd put it into a probiotic bacterium, which would then release it in the intestine. Um, <clears throat> we did succeed in putting it into Lactococcus lactis, where we did see some activity surrounding the um, colonies of the transformants. But again, as we saw with the previous one, the secretion level was far too low to have any meaningful effect, even in vitro. So we didn't proceed to any in vivo work with that. Um, we then looked at nanoparticle technology again for this particular system. And the system we used here was um, a pH triggered release from um, alginate and eudogate. These are polymers made by Evonik. And we, th these are set up to uh, produce pH responsive microcapsules, which protect the nanoparticle content from gastric activity while releasing it when the when the payload while releasing the payload when the environmental pH is increased as it moves down through the intestinal tract. So um, this work was done in collaboration with Danish Malik at Lochberg University, and they had previously demonstrated its, its efficacy with whole phages. And work is in progress at the moment with this C. diff endolysin, which uh, the lads are working with. Um, that's work in progress. Uh, I don't have the data just yet on the level of release. The last few slides here is just me briefly mentioning some work that we did with, um, this is work from a couple of years ago, Gardnerella vaginalis phage endolysin. This is a gram-positive uropathogen, um, which infects the epithelial cells. Um, we cloned an endolysin from this uh, using, using the same method as, as I discussed with the others. It's a glycoside hydrolase and lit lit lytic activity was shown using zymograms. Now we've, we've since doing this work, we've continued a collaboration with Brunel University on other endolysins against this particular pathogen and we have a paper coming out shortly, but I can't say much about it in advance of that paper coming out. And another endolysin we looked at, we were approached by the brewing industry who read one of our older papers and um, they were interested in controlling lactobacillus, which is a major spoilage agent in um, the yeast propagation tanks in breweries. So we cloned an endolysin from lactobacillus oligofermentans and we used the same vector again it's a high-base enzyme and it also works well on zymograms the collaboration with industry didn't actually get up and running but we had done this in preparation for getting a nice brewing project working it's it's work that we hope to advance at some stage and the last one we just that we just dabbled in essentially is an endolysin from um cutie bacterium previously called propione bacterium acnes and we've successfully cloned an endolysin from this particular pathogen as well um, so that's work in progress that we have at present. And I think that's as much as I have. Yeah. So I, I think I've probably run over time a little bit, but um, I'm prepared to answer any questions that you might have at this stage.